To understand blockchain, let's go back to 500 AD on the island of Yap, located in what is now Micronesia. The Yapese people had stones like this everywhere. This is a Yapese coin. It was their money. It's about 200 kilos, so spending these like modern coins, that posed a bit of a problem. Well, the Yapis solved this by not ever physically moving the coins. The coins were placed in very visible locations on their tiny island. Every adult Yapis knew who the owner of each coin was by memory. When two people wanted to transact, they would announce the change in ownership to the other Yapis, who would all update their knowledge of whom the coin belonged to. Voila, the coin was exchanged. The Yapis were using what we would call a distributed ledger. It's a ledger in that each Yapis had a mental record of the ownership of all coins. And they would mentally update that ledger anytime there was a transaction. It's distributed in that the ledger wasn't just known by one person, it was known by all people. Now, the Yapis could have asked one person to keep track of the mental ledger of coins. That person would have to be really trustworthy in terms of both honesty and administration skills. The monopoly that person would have on transaction activity might lead them to charge a fee or make rules for who and when one can transact. And problems would arise if that person fell ill, decided to leave, or if their integrity was compromised in some way. That central person would be a bank. Distributed ledgers perform many bank-like functions without requiring trust in a central entity. In the Yapese example, a person can't tamper with the ledger and claim ownership of a stone that doesn't belong to him, lest all the Yapes come forward and contradict his claim based on their knowledge of the ledger, so fraudulent transactions aren't likely. Also, if one particular member of the tribe isn't available or moves away, thereby losing a copy of the ledger, transactions can still be validated by the other Yapes, so the system is fault-resistant. Perhaps most interesting is what happens if a coin gets destroyed or lost. In one instance, a large stone fell overboard on the way back from the island where they quarry the stone. No problem, the other Yapis decided. We can imagine your coin sitting there in the ocean, we'll give you credit for it, and we will mentally use it for transactions like we do with the others. So even if for all practical purposes the coin doesn't even exist, they could still use it to transact. Distributed ledgers turn out to be one of two key concepts you need to understand blockchain. But before I explain blockchain further, let me first tell you a way to summarize the book War and Peace in just 20 letters. It turns out that every book has a unique untraceable fingerprint. There are certain functions, by which I just mean mathematical equations that computers use, where if you put in a book or a string of characters, you get out the other end a unique 20 to 30 digit code. This code will be unique to any given input. So when you put in war and peace, you'd get a 20 digit gibberish code. If you put in the exact same copy of war and peace, but with one comma changed, you'd get a totally different 20 digit code. These codes would be so different, you'd be unable to connect either code to one another or the original versions of war and peace. Functions that do this have some amazing uses. You can use them to validate information. Let's say you were about to sign a lease and you wanted to make sure that you're signing the same copy as the landlord. You could drop your version and the other into the function, and if there was even a comma difference, they'd yield different 20-digit codes. You can also use functions like this to obscure your identity. You could combine your personal info, your name, date of birth, hair color, into a string of text and put that text into the function to generate a unique 20-digit code. You could then use this code as your internet identity to conduct business online, confident no one could connect it back to you. But if later someone wanted to verify that it was you who owned the code, you can show that you know the only combination of inputs that can regenerate that code. Functions that do this are called cryptographic hash functions, and they are the second concept you need to understand blockchain. First though, let us go back to the idea of invisible coins. We know from the island example that a distributed ledger allows you to transact with coins, even if the underlying coins don't exist, just like the coin at the bottom of the ocean. We also saw how it is nearly impossible to steal coins. This was because each Yapis knows who owns a given coin and whether any transactions have changed that ownership. 
Now imagine that these ledgers, instead of being stored in people's heads, are stored in computers online around the world, managed by incentivized volunteers. It would still work just like with the island. Each computer would have a copy of the ledger showing coin ownership that's visible and known to everyone. Every time a person wanted to make a transaction, she would just announce to the computer network her intention to send coins to someone else. All those computers, upon hearing that announcement, would update their internal ledger by deducting a coin from her and adding a coin to the other person. We would only be missing two things to make this workable in the real world. First thing we're missing, we need a way to disguise the identities of people on the public ledger, since most of us aren't going to put our names and transaction history in public view. We can solve this with a hash function. Each person's identity details can be reduced to an unrecognizable 20-digit code, where only the owner knows the inputs required to generate the code, thus anonymizing participants. The second thing we'd be missing to make this workable is a way to quickly compare ledgers between computers to make sure they're starting from the same version of the transaction record. We can also address this with a hash function. Each computer can turn its ledger, which is just computer text, into a 20-digit code and compare it with codes for ledgers on other computers. If the codes all agree, we know the ledgers are the same. If they're the same, it's likely they represent an accurate view of coin ownership. Implicitly, this makes it almost impossible to tamper with the ledger, because to do so, a person would have to tamper with a thousand other ledger copies stored independently in computers around the world. We've just invented Bitcoin, the digital currency we've all heard so much about. Bitcoin is a shared distributed ledger to transfer invisible coins. Anyone can join this ledger by creating a 20-digit coded identity and obtaining coins from some other users in a transaction. Those concepts, the distributed ledger coupled with hash functions, those together are often called blockchain or sometimes just distributed ledger. The first blockchain was built to enable Bitcoin, but blockchain can be so much more. To illustrate that, we need to see how modern airplanes have become just like iPhones. A year ago, I was taking a flight that had to abort takeoff by coming to a screeching halt halfway down the runway. The captain reassured us it was a minor problem with the wing. You know, the part that keeps the plane in the air. Not to worry, he said. The mechanics would get it sorted. But a bit later, he came back on to let us know it was not a mechanical issue. It was a software bug. No big deal, he said. We're downloading a software patch and should be good to take off in 20 minutes. So while my iPhone is downloading a software update from Apple, my airplane is downloading some do not die update from the airplane manufacturer. This led me to a dark realization. If there are bugs with Wing software, there could soon be Wing software hackers. And such worries actually intensify as we enter the world of autonomous cars, robots that perform surgery, and computers that give financial advice. In fact, professors at University of Michigan demonstrated it was possible to kill patients who have pacemakers by hacking their devices wirelessly. A lot of smart people think blockchain could help give us some security in this automated world. Take the hack plane scenario. Picture 100 planes around the world, each communicating to one another on a network. Before takeoff, my plane could take its wing software and dump it into our friend, the cryptographic hash function, thus generating a unique 20-digit code. You could then imagine the other 99 planes all have ledgers for one another with records of the appropriate 20-digit code each plane should have for its wing software. My plane could compare the code generated by its wing just before takeoff with the code stored on ledgers in the other 99 planes. If the codes match, my plane can be sure that its software has not been tampered with. Why? Because a hacker would have to have changed the ledger on all 99 other planes for my code to agree with the code stored there. If the plane was autonomous, it could decide not to take off unless all 99 planes gave it the okay. A world of safe, smart devices is enabled. And this contrasts with how we'd solve this today. The plane would have had to have communicated with a central server, a single point of failure, vulnerable to fault and tampering. That central server would also be in a closed system, owned by one company, making it hard for other devices to interoperate. Blockchain could change all of this. 
by removing the need for a trusted central intermediary, blockchain could open up new ways of working that are hard to even predict today. With the trend towards faster technology adoption, blockchain is likely to make its impact known sooner rather than later. We hope this video will help you get ready.